So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this Chatham House Russian Eurasia Program webinar on Russian dirty money, how to shut down the London laundromat. Um, that was uh, the bluntest, most direct, most unsubtle title we could possibly think of entirely on purpose. But um, just a quick caveat to dilute it. Of course, the dirty money swooshing about in London and the UK's substantial offshore tax havens is not all Russian. Um, it's hard to say precisely what that percentage is. I've heard guesstimates of up to 40%, but I think they're pretty, pretty rough. But whatever the amount, it's surely considerable. And that is the topic. Russian dirty money is the topic under consideration, under discussion today. And there's no doubt about the topicality of this one, not just because there are now uh, 100 people on this call, but uh, of course, there's a spate of recent books, Tom Burgess's Kleptopia, Jack Clark is forthcoming, The World for Sale, Oliver Burke's Past and Future Work, Past, Money, Land, Future, I think he was telling me about something called The World's Butler, which was referring to the UK's role in all of this, again, as per today. Um, there's substantial research projects, such as Tom Maines and John Hevershaw's on uh, the global integrity anti-money laundering work. There's events everywhere at the moment I am seeing. Um, think tanks run special kleptocracy programs. Uh, of course, there are kleptocracy tours around London. Everybody is on it because as somebody, somebody once said to me, um, <clears throat> none of us like corruption, but it does seem as if we all quite like the money. Um, <clears throat> so, um, and also I suppose, you know, there have been renewed calls lately, but this is the way to go. Not new calls, renewed, because in the light of the incarceration of Navalny and the responses to the protests we've seen in Russia in recent weeks, um, there have been calls to, to follow the money, if you like, and to smart target uh, people with links to the regime and or uh, Vladimir Putin's inner and maybe outer circles. Um, and we see this perhaps with the EU's announcement in the last couple of days about four individuals to, 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 um, to pinpoint. Um, and so after our webinar on, in January on why has nothing been done about the International Security Committee's Russia report, we wondered how we could push this issue a little bit more ourselves. Um, back then, uh, Samantha de Bendern and Timothy Ash clearly had a lot to say, um, and we asked them if they could elaborate um, on their rather forceful chat line interventions and thoughts uh, back then. And we also wanted to see if there were lessons that the UK might learn from elsewhere. And while America has not been known for its financial probity in the last four years, that's perhaps a little unfair as it was focused on, on one person in particular. And, and in fact, uh, the Americans are considerably more advanced processes and, and a better backbone, it seems to me. So Joshua Rudolph has kindly agreed to say a few words on, on his and the US experience in that regard. Therefore, in, in reverse order um, of speaking, perhaps I could just say a few words about the panel, if you'll bear with me. Um, Joshua Rudolph, Rudolph uh, is fellow for Malign Finance at the German Marshall Fund's Alliance for Securing Democracy. He previously served in a range of US government positions uh, at the intersection of finance and national security, including at the IMF and the Treasury, and he coordinated the Russia sanctions in the Obama White House. Before his public service, Josh worked uh, for seven years at JP Morgan in New York. Um, Sam de Bendern has focused on Russia and the CIS related issues um, as a banker in Switzerland and France herself, and as an international civil servant uh, at the European Commission and at NATO HQ. So she's an independent researcher, writer, and advisor on Russia and EU matters at the Conflict Studies Research Center, CSRC. And finally, Tim Ash uh, is Senior Strategist at Blue Bay Asset Management. He's covered Russia and the Emerging Europe uh, region for 30 years uh, at various international banks. And he's a regular writer and blogger on the region, including for Chatham House. Right, bear with me one more minute, please. Last four points from me. Um, first, I say we're on the record today. Um, indeed, the information advice and the warnings I think you're going to hear over the next 19 minutes should be distributed as widely as possible. And we'll be looking to maybe tap more people on the shoulder after this to send them the relevant parts of what will be of a recording uh, of this event. Uh, second, my, um, my Berkshire Wi-Fi is very patchy these days, so I apologize in advance if I freeze out, in which case my colleague Keir Giles um, will take over with his superior uh, Northamptonshire Wi-Fi and his superior chairing skills anyway. Third, um, of course, as usual, uh, there'll be half an hour of um, initial remarks, uh, maybe 10 minutes per speaker. That means another, another one hour after that for questions uh, and discussion. As always, you can send in questions anonymously, privately to me, um, or better still, by, by raising a hand in the chat, and I will see you. Finally, finally, um, I think for this to be useful today, ladies and gents, um, I hope we can talk not just about these <laughs> egregious examples of what we seem to have done to ourselves, although well, you will hear plenty of those, I am absolutely certain, but what I'd like to hear from, from everybody is, is really why we hadn't done anything hitherto, or, or not much, or insufficient, um, and specifically how 
we might at long last take the action. I think most people on this call, most 101 people on this call would agree that we should. So that really is it, ladies and gents. Um, and over to you, Tim. Great, thank you for the introduction. <clears throat> and um, I, I just wanted to ask four questions, maybe to set a framework for <clears throat> the other speakers and maybe the discussion. And, and, um, and I'm gonna rest four things. So basically what's the scale of Russian capital flows to the city to, to give some kind of context in terms of how big is it? You know, why is it a problem? Or why is it a potential problem? You know, uh, why, have, why have we done nothing about it and, and actually what we can do about it? Now, in terms of the, the capital flow uh, story, um, <coughs> usefully the Central Bank of Russia has a nice little section on its website that has pri private capital flows out of Russia. And, and I, I went there and look, if you look at the, the asset accumulation over, overseas and then other capital flows, which is kind of a good proxy for capital flight, the data goes back uh, to 94, 1994, 20 years of, 27 years of coverage. And looking at that and looking at outflow, so purchases of assets overseas and, and the, this idea of capital flight, uh, it, it comes to a figure of about $58 billion a year over that period. So about, well, it's actually 1577 billion on a cumulative basis. And just adding a couple of extra years and, and drawing a line for the, for the period to 91, I get to 1693 billion. Give or take the odd billion, it's, it's $1.7 trillion. Um, now, knowing the importance of the city of London, that's outflow. So the outflow from Russia over that 30-year period was around $1.7 trillion. It's about a whole year of GDP. It's about 5% of GDP on, on an annual basis. Um, now, not all that money has obviously flowed to, to the UK, but I would imagine, given the importance of London to, uh, to Russians, to, to, to the Russian city, uh, and, you know, I, I would think about a third of that probably one way or another. This is back of the envelope calculations on my part. So about 600 billion total cumulative flows uh, through the city over the last 30 years. It's about 4% of UK financial assets uh, per, on, a, on an annualized basis, on a, on a, but obviously it's come over 30 years. Um, now, I, I also try to, you know, what does that mean in terms of revenue, right? And, and uh you know, 600 billion, if you assume half of that stayed in the asset management business, assuming the typical fee structure uh, on asset management, it, it would generate around 50, 50 million a year in revenue for the city. Uh, and also assuming a lot of that, half of that went into real estate, uh, I come up with a figure of about 100 million in revenues from real estate transactions for the city of London. So that's about 150. And then interestingly, if you think of, there's been about $2 trillion of capital market transactions out of Russia. Uh, in the 30-year period, that's debt raising, uh, IPOs, et cetera. And again, looking at the typical fee structure over that period, that would generate revenues uh, for the City of London of about $6 billion uh, over 30-year period, so about $200 million a year. So just putting the three together, $200 million, $50 million, $100, it's about $350 million of fees and asset management um, receipts for managing some of the $600 billion that came, came through the city. See, $350 million, that's a substantial amount of money in, uh, in income stream for the city of London. Again, it's back of the envelope, but I don't think it's necessarily that far from reality. And in terms of the, the, the weight of inflow, 600 billion is, is a substantial amount. Now, actually just assuming the same kind of basis for flows outside of the, of, of the FSU, so Ukraine, Kazakhstan, et cetera, you could probably add around 500 billion in terms of the outflow, so the, the 1.6, 1.7 billion, add another 500 billion, it's about 2.2 trillion outflows in capital from the former Soviet space. And, and, and actually using the same basis in terms of fee generation for the city, you could probably add another 100 million on. So, so annual, annualized fees from Russian money, is possibly around 450 million a year. So, so, you know, substantial, this is big business, clearly for the city of London. You know, why is it a problem? Uh, it's a problem, I guess, first, for two, two main reasons. Firstly, you know, the, 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 um, the, the suspect origin of a lot of that capital. I mean, a lot of it is, is, is not dirty, it's clean, it's, it's uh, generating legal transactions. But, uh, you know, a lot of it isn't. And, and I think the fact that, you know, the city doesn't ask enough questions about the origin of that capital. It is asking more, more questions more recently. But I guess if you go back 10, 20 years, it didn't. Um, I think it's, it's bad and it's a problem because firstly, it acts, uh, it's, it's like a reverse uh, money flow. So 
we essentially law well we the city of london essentially launders or cleanses capital coming out of the former soviet space uh and we and that money then is is cleansed and is put back to work into former soviet states right so you can imagine it's a it's a big weight of of cash that is then used to sustain uh, the lack of rule of law uh, and kleptocracy in Russia and former Soviet states, right? Um, it, 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 it keeps the Wild East status of markets in Ukraine and Kazakhstan, et cetera. And it, it, it enables the continued uh, uh, use of corruption and state capture in these countries to continue to generate these, these excess profits. And in a way, it's, it's interesting how the West complains about countries like Ukraine, about not doing enough about corruption. But by not asking enough questions about the origin of capital flows from former Soviet space, and then acting as a base for that capital be, to be re returned uh, to, to the FSU, to buy interest, to buy politicians, to buy media profiles, media content that's supporting of oligarchs, to, to bribe regulators. You know, we are significantly responsible for the continuation of, of corruption in, um, in many of these countries. The second reason, and I think in a, in a way, uh, the, the crux of the issue or, or the crux of the debate today is Russia itself. Um, you know, clearly, 600 billion of assets offshore, in, well, in London, 1.7 trillion offshore in general, provides Russia with a great amount of buying power, a, a great ability to buy influence in the West. Uh, now, we've assumed, maybe naively, that Russia is a, is a benign actor. Uh, that uh, it wants to share with us in the success of Western liberal democracy. Uh, and it's simply, you know, uh, pr pr dumping these funds in, in the city of London and other financial centres and providing all this income stream to help us develop our, our Western liberal democracy. I think the reality is that, you know, we all know that Russia has proven not to be uh, a benign actor. It's been a malign actor. And I think the question is, you know, if we assume that Russia is a malign actor and our governments tell us that it is, why would it not use the, the power of the city of London, the power of, the power of this capital and this income flow to, to buy interests and push its own agenda uh, in, our, in our Western liberal democracies? And I think uh, what we've seen is, uh, certainly it's my view, we can certainly debate, debate it later, but you know, Russia has proven that it, it's not in a, it doesn't see itself in a, in, in a, uh, a consensual relationship with the West. Uh, it, it sees itself in, in competition with the West. And, and certainly perhaps since 2011, you could perhaps go back to 2007 and, and, and Putin's uh, Munich Security Council speech. Uh, but I think we see a track record of Russia acting to undermine Western liberal democracy, whether it's in Ukraine, whether it's in Georgia, whether it's in Montenegro, whether it's intervening uh, to support the, the far right, far left agenda throughout Western liberal democracy, support Brexit, support the MAGA agenda in the US. You know, uh, and, uh, and I, would, I would argue that, you know, the, the, on the balance of evidence, the monies, the capital that's flown into Western in the city, well, the UK, the UK and also other, other Western liberal democracies has probably been used to fund, fund those activities. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of money coming in. It is a problem. Why have we done nothing about it? I mean, the, there's the, the one, you know, the, there's the ignorance that si simply we're in denial of the problem. We, 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 we're not understanding of the, the threat of Russia uh, as a malign actor. Uh, maybe the whole Soviet studies elite that we're all kind of part of, of, of aged and the new crew of, of politicians like Macron, you know, have no experience of that Soviet era where, where, where Moscow was a malign actor and they, they view things quite differently. Uh, so there's a denial there. Uh, maybe the denial is, is, has been funded, obviously, by uh, the, 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 um, the, the use of some of those funds to, to buy, buy interest. I, I think there's, there's also a, a, a denial of the reality by, you know, uh, interests that have certainly benefited perhaps by some of this, uh, this malign activity. The MAGA agenda, the Brexit agenda, th there's a, there's a uh, desire not to accept that perhaps their victories weren't completely on, on their own merit and that they were perhaps egged on by, by Russia's desire to, to be a, 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 a less helpful actor. Um, 
Um, and I, I think perhaps also this, in terms of the, the this, it's often, um, there's often a desire, particularly on the part of the military, uh, to view this as kind of a kinetic kind of battle uh, with Russia. And, and in a way, acts, there's, there's, a, there's a desire not to accept that, you know, the fall of communism in 89, the form of the Soviet Union in 91, was, a, was not a definitive victory, that actually we didn't really win the war, and that the threat from Russia has continued. And, uh, and perhaps uh, that, that they, the military tend to see things through the, the prism of a, of a rifle or a military budget. Whereas, you know, I, I think what, what the threat and risk, particularly for the city of London, needs, you know, other, uh, other kind of uh, attributes to be able to push back on it. Maybe, maybe our, the NATO budget uh, you, you know, if we're going to if we're going to push back on Russian malign in, interest through the city of London, it it it, it requires very different um, different skill sets that perhaps our military are, are, are kind of used to. Um, just just to give an example of um, you know you you may say say well show me evidence show me evidence of of how you know Russia has used this malign interest or, or uh, to uh, to shape the view to sh to, to kind of uh, set the agenda. Uh, in terms of Russia, Russia, Western relations, and I'll give you two very ex good examples from my own personal experience. Um, two two situations I had, and I'm not going to be very specific in terms of who they entail, but I was working as a sell side analyst in the bank some years ago, writing commentary, macro commentary, political risk commentary about Russia and the CIS space, and it was a time the time of the Crimean, the annexation of Crimea, and um, at the, I was writing stuff that, that you know the little green men seemed very likely to be uh, Russian soldiers, which is obviously proven to be totally correct. And I think any, any person with any Soviet studies experience would have known it was absolutely Russians. I got a phone call from a very, very large Russian energy company who phoned my management and said, uh, can we come and see Tim? Because he's writing all this stuff about Crimea and Ukraine and Russia. We want to know how he's getting to his view. And they turned up. Uh, I've never had that experience in, in 20 years as a, as a bank analyst in the city. No, no, no energy company, no corporate, was asked to come to see me to talk about my specific views about a country. They turned up four people and interrogated me on, on why I was getting my views on, on this particular situation. And, and, you know, I felt intimidated. I felt that uh, they were trying to shape and, and drive my, my views and they were trying to intimidate the particular bank I worked with to stop me saying those kind of things. And, and I think I was an experienced sovereign analyst um, I, I didn't back down. I continued to express their views. And the second one, which is very similar, similar time period around the Crimean annexation, um, the bank I was working with at the time had a very large uh, 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 a private client, let's put it this way, a large oligarch uh, that was a client of the bank. And again, similar story, uh, pressure and messaging through the salespeople at the particular institution but this client didn't like my views. They didn't like my views on, on Russia, on Ukraine, on Crimea, and that the, the business of the bank was in, at risk if I continued to write those views. So again, we have two, this is two specific examples of a large state-owned energy company trying to, trying to push the view in the city of London or, or the analyst view. And then an oligarch, a specific oligarch, again, trying to do uh, something very similar. So, so again, just, just finally, you know, what, what, what can we do about it? I mean, I've, I've spoke, probably spoken spoken too long, but uh, I mean, my view is, um, you know, we need to understand and accept the threat. Uh, we need to expose the threat, be very transparent. Uh, we need to understand, you know, what Russia is trying to do and and how it operates, and and that it is has great leverage over us. Um, it, it, there's a lot of focus on, you know, KYC and maybe what I would argue is that the, the existing KYC rules in the city are, are strong enough. Banks need to be pushed to enforce them much more vigorously. Um, I, I, uh, I would probably leave it there. I, I know that the other two speakers have probably got more specific, uh, specific solutions, I would say, in terms of the, the, the Russian capital issue. So, friends. Tim. No, Tim, thank you very much indeed. That was that was super. And you did you did go very much into, into the why and what we can do about it. And uh, that's terrific. And I, I remember, Tim, from a, 
uh, from your chat line in the previous uh, in the previous webinar, I was referring to you were you were mentioning something about how how why do we regard why do we sort of have, have a presumed innocent idea? Surely we should regard all Russian money as as guilty before innocent, not innocent before guilty. And I might bring you back on that later, not 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 right now. But I also in relation to what you just said, I've quoted many times very American author Upton Sinclair who said that. Uh, it's very hard to get a man to understand to understand something if his salary depends on him not understanding it. And I think that sums up a lot of what you said. I'm also very keen to know what happened in the second of your examples, Tim, but maybe that's a bit of a, a difficult question for you and I won't push you on that one. Uh, anyway, over to Sam. Sam, please. Hi, thanks, James, for inviting me. And Tim, thanks for that really interesting um, description of the um, quantitative uh, situation that we're looking at with Russian money coming into the UK. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try and do some a little bit of sort of qualitative analysis on this and look at uh, why we think that this Russian money that is coming into the UK is, uh, is a problem and is not what we would call clean money. And to do this, I thought I would look at the heart of the laundromat, which is the London Stock Exchange. Now, um, I decided to look at the num all the Russian companies that have been floated on the London Stock Exchange in the last 25 years. And by Russian companies, I mean companies that are registered in the Russian Federation and companies that have interest in the Russian Federation or whose beneficial owners are Russians, but are registered in either offshore jurisdictions or other countries like the UK, Cyprus, Luxembourg, etc. Now, just a little quick reminder for the non-financial specialists here, and I hope I'm not stating things that, things that are too obvious, but when a company is floated on the stock exchange, it generates wonderful fees for lawyers, PR specialists, accountants, everything else. And of course, the beneficial owners, the people who have floated their company, end up with large amounts of cash in their pocket that they can then reinvest into companies that they can then use for um, purchase of real estate that they can then give to, um, oh, I've lost my Zoom here, that they can then give to um, private asset managers. And because the money comes from the flotation of a company, money is clean, it has a clear origin, there will be no unexplained wealth orders here, and if they are, there will be perfectly um, legitimate explanations for where the money comes. So what's the problem with this money? It's all perfectly transparent and clear. Well, I looked at 50 companies that are currently listed on the stock exchange, and I looked at about just over a dozen that have been delisted in the past few years. Some of them have been delisted because of sanctions-related issues. And out of these 60 or so companies, when I looked into the shareholding structure, when I looked into the history of these companies, I actually only found five that didn't raise any red flags. That's less than 10%. Now, by red flags, I mean companies that had links directly or indirectly to the Russian state, to the Siloviki KGB mafia type Putin circle from the St. Petersburg in the 90s, or to the metals and mining sector, where anyone who's studied Russia over the past 30 years will know that it has had very strong origins in criminal groupings in the early 90s. There is another set of companies that either belong to or were created by oligarchs who started off after privatizations, much younger people who started genuine businesses, and um, some of them very brilliant people, um, who, because of the kind of money they were making, ended up either being co-opted into the regime or having um, parts of their company bought by organizations or individuals who were close to Putin. So basically, all this money that is being floated on the London Stock Exchange is, is, belongs to individuals or companies that incarnate a system that has carried out hostile acts on our territory. Now, I don't know if, if when, when we actually let that information sink in, it, it's pretty scary. And by hostile acts, I, I, I don't think anyone needs reminding of, of what happened with Litvinenko, of the Skripal poisoning, then we have um, a number of British people, businessmen and Russian businessmen who met very violent deaths on British soil, deaths that have not been properly investigated by the, according to the people who are close to the victims. And if those of you who are interested in this, there's a fantastic BuzzFeed report which goes into this in a lot of detail. Hostile acts, by hostile acts, they also mean meddling in our political system. Uh, again, the Russia report has highlighted 
the uh, potential Russian meddling in the Scottish referendum, in Brexit, um, in the recent UK elections, in the European elections. Uh, there are other cases in other European countries, not even to mention what has happened in the US. So basically, we are facilitating the enrichment of a system that is undertaking activities that are undermining our democracies. But I don't think that's the most worrying aspect. You know, if Russia is doing what it's always done and has always done very well, the most worrying aspect here is the lackluster British response from Litvinenko's murder when Theresa May resisted a public inquiry for a very long time. One of the reasons there was, oh, well, we really don't want to upset the Russians. So you know, let, let them you know, use radiological weapons on our, on our soil. We just don't want to annoy them by inquiring into what actually happened. Um, the, uh, again, the botched police operations after the unexplained deaths. And there was a very strong response to the Skripal uh, poisoning. I guess when you start using chemical weapons on British soil, there has to be some sort of response. And while all this is happening, um, our prime minister is partying with oligarchs when he's a foreign secretary. And when he's just after he's been elected, he's elevating the son of a former KGB officer to the House of Lords. The Tory party is accepting large amounts of money from British citizens of Russian origin. And according to some of our tabloids, these people may even have suspected links to the Kremlin. Now, this may all be perfectly in. I'm not saying that there's some nefarious plan that's taking place here. But from a public relations point of view, it actually looks pretty awful. Now, I just would like to remind all of the people listening here of something that they, they, I'm sure they all know about, which are what are called active measures. Uh, that the KGB's active measures that are now a part of the arsenal of subversion of today's Russian foreign policy, one of the key aspects of active measures is to undermine public confidence in political elite of a particular target country. I'm not saying that we are a victim of active measures, but if we were, if the only thing that someone in Russia or someone in the Kremlin was doing was to throw out all these relationships with the simple purpose of undermining our confidence in the government, well, I think they've been pretty bloody successful. So in terms of what is to be done, I think the first thing that needs to be done is to have an open discussion about the Russian threat and to really start calling a spade a spade. And this has to be done at the highest levels of our government. This has to be done by MPs asking more questions to the government about um, the scale of, of, first of all, the, the scale of Russian money going around London, and also the kind of relationships that have been developed by, the gov by members of the government with high-ranking Russian business people and officials. Now, there have been other suggestions that have been made by MPs, by think tanks, um, and what I would like to do here is, is, is summarize them. Perhaps to start off by some of my own experience as, um, James explained, I worked um, in banking for a long time and, and I was even a private banker and I had a lot of Russian clients. I, I was part of this whole facilitating mechanism. I like to think that uh, the clients I onboarded um, were actually pretty okay. And I did do a lot of work and due diligence on them before I, 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 I would bring them in. But if I had a client or potential client who had just floated a company on the stock exchange or who had just um, sold a company privately or had just um, raised a lot of money in the city of London. This would be the perfect client to bring to my compliance department. Why? Because no further questions would be asked or very few questions would be asked. And I had situations where I had clients who had very, very dodgy backgrounds, that they had just made a very important transaction on the world markets, and that was it. The amount of money that was made in that transaction corresponded to the amount of money that was put into the bank, and it got through. So I think that, as, as uh, Tim said, the laws that we have are, are actually very, very strict, but how these laws are being enforced and whether the private sector people who are working with Russian money really understand the scale of the threat and their responsibility from a national security point of view to um, think slightly beyond their own 
their own pockets, which is difficult, I admit, but that, that is a very important thing. Now, the Russia report emphasizes the need for um, coordination amongst our various law enforcement bodies. But what about our international cooperation? Um, our international cooperation, in fact, has been seriously undermined by Brexit. We don't have any more access to Europol. And as um, a very famous British QC, Ben Emerson, said recently, um, we now have to rely on Interpol. And Interpol as an organization has shown itself to be exceptionally vulnerable to political abuse by the Russian state and other people and um, non-Russian state actors. Um, in terms of our police resources, the Russia report also highlights the need for language training, the needs for um, officers to understand the Russian culture. But one of my concerns is that our security services, where um, people usually retire quite soon, I mean, often before 60, are losing expertise. This is something that Tim highlighted as well, are losing expertise um, amongst people who started their careers in the Cold War, who, who really understood the Soviet mindset, the KGB mindset, which is very much the same mindset, which is um, in force in Russia today. So what is, what is being done to do this? Are, are people, are young people being trained or can we perhaps continue pooling in the expertise of the older generation? Uh, in terms of financing our political parties, um, as, as has been highlighted by a lot of people in other forums, uh, the Brit Britain lacks the equivalent of a Foreign Agents Registration Act. Um, this is something I think would be really, really needed, not necessarily to start stopping money coming in, but to give the public the reassurance that donations that are being made are going through some kind of scrutiny. I'm going again back to the fact I'm not saying that that the various things are happening behind the scenes, I'm saying that it does not look good. And we need some serious effort by the government to, to, to get its PR act together in terms of Russia. And something like a Foreign Agents Registration Act would probably go a long way. Um, there have been people who've been talking about the vulnerability of our judiciary to influence um, by, by, by Russia. Um, the Henry Jackson Society has come out with a very interesting report which highlights the, uh, the fact that the Kremlin abuses the international legal system to further its own, uh, its own aims and that the UK is particularly vulnerable to this. Can we do anything to stop this? Well, we can make sure that our judges are sensitive to the issue. Again, perhaps should there be a parliamentary inquiry into this or should parliament try to legislate on this? Um, last but not least, uh, in all the discussions that, that I've seen about how to coordinate law enforcement and um, how to combat illicit finance, there's been very little mention of non-state actors, Companies House, the London Stock Exchange. How, how can these organisations be co-opted into the discussion, be sensitised to the issue? Um, you know, the, the, the head of Russia's CIS market at the London Stock Exchange is this person... Uh, of course, I'm not, I'm not advocating that we should start having security service agents inside all these bodies and become a sort of, you know, copy of, of, of the Soviet Union. But this is something you should be thinking about. And of course, thinking about by being very careful not to compromise um, our democratic values. And last but not least, um, libel laws. A lot of things I've wanted to say today, I've... Uh, exercised a certain amount of self-control because of the British libel laws. And until there's a serious look at these, I don't think there can be any real open discussion on this issue, because in order for a discussion to have some value, we have to be able to name names, we have to be able to come up with concrete examples. And a lot of these concrete examples, as soon as accusations start being made against individuals, against companies, the person who makes those accusations ends up um, but potentially facing a very, very heavy fine. And that is a serious impediment on free speech in our country. So that's about it for now. Um, I'll leave it over to you, James, and looking forward to hearing what Josh has to say.
Sam, that's superb. Thank you very much indeed. I won't try to summarize all that, but a lot of things resonated with me there. Um, not least, uh, you mentioned Theresa May and, and the horrific phrase, but I recall anyway, that uh, not to tackle Russia would affect trade and slash or international relations. I still shudder when I when I think of that. You mentioned, of course, Tory party funding, and I, I, I would just like to say perhaps that it's not just the Tory party. We obviously, uh, the most recent Corbyn leadership, the previous Corbyn leadership, I should say, um, was not well known for its uh, tough attitude towards to Russia, to say the least. But even before before that, when the Labour Party were actually in power, then we all, if we want to make our skin crawl, remember Derry Pascoe on his yacht, um, on, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Mandelson on Derry Pascoe's yacht, sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, so it does appear to be a cross-party problem. And then most recently on libel laws, I certainly hear you there because, you know, everything that Chatham House has to write these days of any substantial nature has to go through legal peer reviews. And, and I find that, you know, there's an element to which we are being watered down too much because, you know, as you sort of allude to, Sam, in costs exceed damages so you can't win even if you win right um josh tell us how to do it please does that resonate with you well yes absolutely resonates there's a number of points i'm going to to repeat i've already learned a lot from 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 tim and sam so so thank you both and thanks james for for hosting us at your fantastic uh, russia eurasia program both my former experience and a lot of my current research um are focused first and foremost on on the US government and now how to use this moment with the new administration that really understands the threat of Russian oligarchs and the, and, and the dangers of their of their dirty money, how to coordinate work on this issue and, and what to prioritize. I focus on the US um, also because we have a lot of work to do at home, frankly, just catching up to even where the UK is on, on financial transparency and security protections. We have to implement our new beneficial ownership law. Um, we need to expand our anti-money laundering regulations to cover DNFBP enablers. So, like, not just the the, the bankers and, and asset managers that you know that Tim was tabulating their fees and, and Sam was discussing, but also AML programs for private equity and hedge funds, lawyers, accountants, real estate, and and the rest. We have a lot of work to do on that, particularly in the United States, getting our own house in order. But at the same time, um, as we do that, I'm also urging the, the Biden administration to build an international consensus to advance sweeping, sweeping reforms against corruption and kleptocracy, starting at the G7 hosted by Boris Johnson this summer and building up momentum then to, uh, to Biden's summit for democracy. Um, we could talk more about what that global effort should entail, including some really ambitious possibilities like, you know, a landmark international agreement to end offshore financial secrecy once and for all everywhere, backed up by concrete commitments. Um, but the part of that campaign that I want to share with you um, today is my recommendations for the British government and for the Biden administration in terms of what they should be uh, asking for from Downing Street, not only because our topic uh, today is how to shut down the London uh, laundromat, but also because America has no more, more, no more important partner than Britain in shutting down global uh, flows of dirty money for, for two reasons. Most importantly is that the, the Anglo-American financial systems, of course, the main destination and, and great enabler of ill-gotten uh, Ill gains on a grand scale. But then also um, more kind of politically, tactically, my sense is that Johnson may be more enthusiastic than, than some other allies at this particular moment to, to work closely with the Biden administration as we saw in, for example, the tone um, at, at the Munich Security Conference uh, last, last week. Let me just uh, share my screen with you. In terms of, of what though that, that collaboration <clears throat> could look like the strongest foot that the special relationship should now lean on is is is, is rooting dirty money out of delaware and london right our, our leaders could project a compelling image of of two guys bringing the rule of law and transparency back to the the financial havens from whence they came like you know promethean fire or nixon goes to china choose your your comparison and i think that the biden administration could find this possibility intriguing, but would also want to set a really high bar in terms of the strength of committed actions that would have to back up an image like this. And I've laid out, you know, in my in my other research, what that should be on the US side. And on the UK side, it would, 
it would essentially be in the vein of picking up in the direction where the governments of David Cameron in 2016 anti-corruption summit were go or or Theresa May after after Skripal they were each starting to go before being being each swept away by Brexit um, and really showing that that the British government is, is going to generate results in getting um, getting dirty money out of London would not be about just sanctioning bad actors or or having an illicit finance um, you know legal regime that's t that's FATF compliant as a technical matter. It would be about enforcement. In fact, if there's one thing that you know, one point I'd like to leave you um, with, it's that in order to be credible, the centerpiece of British efforts against against dirty Russian money have to have to be enforcement within the UK and not even just banks enforcing KYC rules as, as Tim mentioned but government criminal investigations this is something that Biden personally has, has has argued quite forcefully in a very different context in Ukraine you know for example going to Kiev and saying loud and clear to you know leaders at the top and to parliament everyone beyond just meeting your IMF technical conditions around corruption you, you really need to start punishing Russian cronies and their proxies. And I think we're actually starting to see a little bit of that with Zelensky getting religion in recent, in recent weeks, um, maybe motivated by Biden coming back, who knows. But in, in, in the UK, um, the best place to start with that is, of course, the ISC parliamentary uh, Russia report from last summer. Doing what Theresa May said after Skripal, giving the NCA the authorization and the resources that they need to produce major investigative results. And this is where it would be a big turn for Prime Minister, Prime Minister Johnson, because I'm not just talking about improving law enforcement's response function as a general matter. I'm saying commit to conducting major investigations of all of the elite Russian expats reportedly named in the classified annex of the ISC report, and so for each of these these folks, I mean, you go to the annex, you you, you know look up look up all of them, and, and have the I, the the NCA conduct major Mueller style investigations. Which you know, thinking of the Mueller investigation, that's that's thousands of subpoenas and warrants and phone tapping and flipping witnesses. The main difference here is that we're also talking about following the money, which is something that Mueller did not do in a particularly comprehensive way. But that's what's needed for, for the elite Russian expats named in the IC report. By the way, I, I include Abramovich here on this page, just because, not because he's one of the, the donors per se of IC, but because Catherine Belton reported that it was Putin himself who had the original idea and gave the order to, to send Abramovich on, on a golden visa to establish a beachhead on the Thames, win over the British people by investments in Chelsea. Um, I know that all of this would be an enormous lift for any for any conservative government. Um, but like I said, it would build on the momentum of, of Cameron in May. Um, and it, it could arguably only be done respectably by a conservative government to purge Russian money from its own coffers. And it's, it's the single most important thing that, that Britain could do. Of course, there's also uh, important legislative priorities, like you know, Sam recommended a, a British FARA, great, um, a you know, continued reform of Companies House, uh, registration of overseas entities bill um, is, is a really good idea. And finally, also coordination, um, high level coordination against against dirty money. This, you know, has to be both internal within Whitehall. It could, it could look like, you know, adding economic crime back to back to the job title of the security minister as it was under Ben Wallace and making corruption and kleptocracy that minister's top national security priority externally, you know, it, lifting up these these international um, coordination bodies, giving them more prominence, resources, and expectations to, to go big with results. And of course, all of that to be done right needs to come down from highest level, led visibly by the prime minister, perhaps through, you know, a speech committing to using Britain's financial position to lead the, uh, the international effort against, uh, against dirty money. So a lot to do starting with enforcement, working together in the context of the, of the special relationship. And, and uh, I think this is the, the moment to, uh, to push forward. So thank you for, for listening and I'm, and I'm looking forward to having a conversation. Thank you very much indeed, Josh. That was superb and, and a lot to do, but I, I still think we have a lot to learn from you. And perhaps whilst I encourage questions from everybody, ideally 
orally, but if not uh, written in written form, then I could just ask you the first question, which has actually come to me anonymously in, a, in an email. That sounds, sounds suspicious, doesn't it? But it's, <laughs> it's pretty good. Um, you didn't cover this, so Josh, it is a good question for you. Uh, it's as follows. The UK needs uh, an equivalent to the Lobbying Disclosure Act and the Foreign Agents Registration Act of the US. How would you improve these legislations so that they can be more effective and to adapt them for the UK? Can you go into that very slightly? You didn't talk for as long as the other, so I can allow you a few minutes if that's okay and give people a chance to sort of um, to type or, or, or formulate their own questions. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And in fact, I will just for a moment here, go back to my, my screen share. It's this bullet here on foreign agent registration, right? It, I think is the, is the question. Um, and so, so yeah, Brit Britain needs bar. It should, like I say here, cover PR agencies and reputation firms, as well as members of par parliament, you know, uh, members of the House of Lords. Um, it has to be comprehensive. Uh, it, you know, you, you can rerun the Australia play from a couple of years ago. Australia is also on the front lines of authoritarian malign influence, in that case, more often coming from China. And when they had a couple of big scandals in this regard uh, uh, a couple of years ago, they, they did a lot. Um, but where they started, it was just catching up with international best practices, including one uh, piece of that was was FARA, building a law based on FARA, but also improving upon it, as your you know, questioner kind of alluded to. There's a lot of uh, ideas in the United States uh, kicking around Congress, been, have been for years that we hopefully will be able to get to soon about how to improve FARA. I mean, really what it needs is, is good enforcement, but there are ways to close, for example, the lobbying loophole. And that's what Australia did. They essentially took FARA and the contemplated reforms and enacted that. And uh, that's what the, the uh, UK should do as well. Great. So I was wrong. You actually did cover it. Um, but thank you very much for, for elaborating on that. I really appreciate that. Um, thank you very much to Josh and to all the panelists. That's superb. Uh, we've got, we've got I, said, I said there'd be an hour. It's 45 minutes. That's entirely my bad. But um, we have a question in already. You can probably see it. It's from David Morton. He's a former BBC correspondent, amongst other things. And he says, we're talking specifically about Russia. But how bad is Russia to the, compared to the other dirty money players, perhaps Nigeria and China, presumably the, um, the, the, the Gulf states as well, I presume, and, and a few more? Um, maybe, maybe, maybe Tim first and then Sam, potentially? Yeah, sure. I, I think the difference is, you know, what Russia is trying to achieve. Say, say compare Russia with Nigeria, with uh, you name it, uh, Kazakhstan or China, right? I mean... What it, you know, accepting dirty money is bad anyway because of you know the corrupting influence it has on the countries, the origin, the origin of the countries, the origin of the money in the first, like, like I mentioned before. But I think what's different about Russia is Russia is a malign actor actually trying to attack our system, right? This is a very different player, and it's it's trying to use the city and finance as one of its tools. I mean, it's it's kind of interesting. I was just thinking back, and you know. Um, you know, I, I think we need to understand that, you know, the city of London is systemic, right? Rule of law is systemic. You know, all the things that make Western liberal democracies work effectively, right? It, it's, it's a critical kind of plank of that, right? And, and unlike those other countries, I don't think China is, is trying to change our way of governance, right? I don't think it is trying to, you know... Uh, impact on the democratic process, particularly in the UK or, or the USA. Russia is, right? And it's, it's using, you know, the systemic pillars of our system to achieve that agenda. And the city is absolutely systemic. And I think, you know, I, I, I think this idea that I try to portray that, that um, maybe we, we don't put enough emphasis on the importance of the city in terms of our defences. I mean, relative to, say, cyber and the military. I mean, would, you know, there's all this furor about the China and, and 5G, right? I mean, would we let Russia into <laughs> 5G, right? Absolutely not, you know. Uh, would we let Russia into the F-35 project? Absolutely not. But we ask no questions particularly about Russia and the city. But it's equally systemically important to, to how we live as all the other stuff, right? <laughs> right? Uh, so I think that's the difference between the money coming from you know, other other uh, other countries with uh, suspect rule of law. Uh, Russia, it's the it's the very malign actions of the Russia against our systems. Uh, that's a very fair answer, and I, I certainly do agree with that. Although I suppose 
if the China question is debatable, that may have been true a few years ago. It's, it's you could at least debate that right now. But um, just before I move on to another question, um, somebody's just asked about: Is it comparable to the situation in France or Italy, Tim? After this, I'm going to come to Sam. Comparable in terms of are, are they better? Are, are they cleaner than the? Yeah, I think that was. I think that was a point. Yeah. I, I doubt it very much. Right. I mean, it, it's a common problem throughout Western finance. I mean, uh, you know, I, I can't imagine Italy or France is any better than the UK, to be honest. It's just we get more of the money. Understood. Thanks a lot. Sam, over to you for, for the original question and perhaps to take on uh, Mary Dzhevsky's, well, at least one of Mary Dzhevsky's points to you, in, 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 I think, which I know you've seen. I think, yeah, I think so far as comparing Russia to any of the other countries, um, without repeating what, what uh, Tim has said, um, there, there is a difference in terms of the way um, hostile acts have been carried out in our soul, and I want to repeat that. Secondly, we're talking about Russia today. We're not talking about China or Nigeria. And I think if we were talking about China or Nigeria, we'd also have a lot to say. And uh, this brings me back to uh, the point that was made by Mary Dzhevsky. I'm not singling out Russia because it's Russia. I'm singling out Russia because we're talking about Russia today. And it's also because it's the country I know the most. Um, are there other problems with other countries? Yes, of course there are. But um, in so far as <clears throat> Russia is concerned, we do have a history that goes back over practically 100 years now, of using disinformation and of using uh, the, the Biden rule, of using the concept of penetrating a country's elites to undermine it. And um, is money, is the money that we're making in London or laundering in London, London facilitating that? I would say that it is. Uh, second, uh, Marie Dzhevsky says that I many times said I'm not saying, suggesting or advocating that. Yes, I did say that. I did uh, couch a lot of what I said in those kind of disclaimers, precisely because we do have libel laws. But I think nobody here is under any illusions to what I'm actually trying to really say. <laughs> Thank you. I told you earlier, I told you in a separate conversation, Sam, I'm not worried about the, the libel or slander laws in, laws in this particular instance, but I, I do worry about it when we, when we publish things, I must say. Um, thank you very much indeed. Josh, you just wrote to me a private message saying you'd like to weigh in on this. I'm not quite sure particularly what the, this was, but, but do yeah. you want to go, Josh? Yeah, sure. So yeah. Um, to provide a little bit of data on the, this question, two questions we've had about the country by country distribution of both the perpetrating regimes and, and the target countries within Europe. Um, I published a piece on this last August, I spent a year on this it's called Covert Foreign <coughs> Money, um, where we uh, basically surveyed all the cases in, in the past, in the, in the past, I'm sorry, can you, what, give me a second, I hope you can see this piece, Covert Foreign Money. Yep. Um, yeah, it, we surveyed all of the cases over the past decade of a foreign government or their proxies funneling money secretly into foreign countries to interfere in their uh, in their political processes. And shockingly, it jumped way up in the middle of the last decade around the time of Ukraine and Xi Jinping coming into power and enabling United Front in, in China. But you can see here, we're talking about Russia for good reason. It's not just that this, this panel is about it, but 80% of the cases are Russia. And, and we did not do this, we, this research filtering out in any way for particular regimes. We would have even put the United States in there if they're running covert ops to influence, to, to, send, to send money into foreign governments, uh, uh, for, for foreign countries' political processes, as the CIA was, for example, in the Cold War. We don't do that anymore, but there's a lot of examples here, uh, mostly Russia, and in terms of distribution of which countries they hit, it is all over Europe. But it's also a good reason that we're talking about London, because these oligarchs in their proxies funneling money, especially to the Tory party, are you can see this big red blob of all of these cases in London. But it, yeah, France, Germany, the others that were asked about, there's cases all over and even internationally. I mean, China is more active in like the, the, the Asia Pacific and Russia more so in Europe, but it's, it's all over the world. Thank you very much indeed. Uh... I'd like to bring in a couple of oral questions, if I may. Now, I'll go to Craig Kennedy first, if I may. If we could, un if we could unmute Craig, that would be great. Great. Just introduce can yourself, you, would you, Craig? Can, yeah. Can yes, Jim. Can you hear me? Great. Um, uh, my name is Craig Kennedy, and I wanted to share a perspective from within the banks. I know we've heard from a couple of people with banking experience already, uh, but uh, I spent uh, over twenty years working with global banks uh, here in London. Uh, and had uh, sat in on very many dozens and dozens of both um, client onboarding 
committees as well as risk assessment committees. I was often brought in because I'm actually trained as a Russianist. Uh, and I wanted to, to share a couple of views on um, trends that I saw over time and challenges that banks actually face. There are risk control groups within <clears throat> banks, uh, and those um, often are people by highly professional specialists. They have to deal with a variety of different types of risk, everything from financial risk uh, to political risk. And um, what I noticed over 20 years, starting in the mid 90s, is that there was a gradual race to the bottom in terms of what was acceptable risk with respect to Russia. Early on, um, banks were especially cautious, not knowing whether <laughs> certain people would be um, uh, 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 sufficiently reputable or safe to deal with. Uh, but within five or 10 years, people who had been persona non grata within certain banks had become favored clients. Mm. And this happened in part um, because we were looking at what the competition was doing, and there was always somebody who was more aggressive. Uh, and that, in turn, was brought back into the internal discussions and said, well, look, Bank X is doing it. Why can't we? Uh, it also was a result of uh, banks just generally getting more comfortable with things. But I also think there was a, a, a relaxing of fears and concern. And remember, the two sentiments that drive banks are fear and greed. Uh, and so uh, the problem that we often had in these discussions was there was no clear sense coming from regulators as to what is acceptable and what is not. Now, that's not always the case. If you look at other jurisdictions, places like Iran, for example, unless you happen to be a very uh, aggressive <laughs> French bank, um, and I won't name names, uh, nobody touched Iran because we all knew that that was the third rail of uh, finance. And in particular, that message was, was driven home by OFAC, um, the, Oran, uh, the Office of um, Foreign Asset Control, part of the US Treasury, which was um, the one name that every banker feared and every risk um, agent would, uh, mm -hmm. or, or risk officer uh, would comply with. So I think with respect to Russia, if you want to get the banks and others uh, to be more uh, conservative in their judgments, it's absolutely critical to have much clearer guidance coming from the government. This is not something that a patriotic sense is going to drive bankers to embrace. Uh, there has to be clarity. And the problem is, there's been very little clarity until um, the advent of the, the, the post-Crimea sanctions regime. And even now, there are still a lot of gray areas. So I, I would leave that as a question to, to Josh and others, what can be done or what, what do you think should be done um, from the regulatory side to, to try and provide greater clarity? Thanks very much indeed, Craig. I really appreciate that and the benefit of your considerable experience as well. So let's go to Josh first, but then after that, I think I'm, I'm gonna ask Sam to say something about France and maybe uh, Tim, about Kazakhstan, if possible. But uh, over to you, Josh. Yeah, so on the US side, this is an important, hot, recent debate. Uh, wh where within our regulatory apparatus do we provide clarity and guidance around what the risks are? Everyone, if you ask, even in DC, what's the most important part of Treasury for this fight against dirty money, uh, corruption, kleptocracy? Everyone will say OFAC. That is not, I mean, I recently did a, did a report on the, how the Treasury should wage their war on corruption. <clears throat> you mentioned OFAC 16 times. By far, more important, seven times more, 110 times, we, we had recommendations for, for FinCEN. FinCEN is the part, uh, the, the, the foreign intelligence unit, the part of Treasury <clears throat> um, that administers our, what's called our Bank Secrecy Act and, and basically helps out law enforcement. And, and there is this recent consensus in the anti-money laundering world that we're not set up the systems, the compliance, not set up to be effective, to be risk-based, to be focused on what the right risks are. And so we recently had our legislation that rewrote the entire purpose of all of those laws. And in just a couple of months now, FinCEN is gonna to have to start issuing its national AML priorities every, every four years. What I'm trying to do right now is get I had a piece on this last week, get the Treasury Department to quickly come out with a national risk assessment on corruption to emphasize that that is, is the focus because the previous administration was like all focused on WMDs. Um, but wh whatever the Treasury FinCEN says are the priorities, then banks are going to have to shift their compliance towards that and make sure they're giving extra diligence in whatever it is, WMD perflators or, or um, uh, Rus Russian oligarchs. So, so yeah, the FIUs have an important role. Thanks, Josh. Sam, I don't know if you want to continue that thought, but I know you want to say something about France. 
Uh, you're still you're, you're on mute again, Sam. <laughs> Try again. Yeah. yeah. All right, here. Um, yes, I'd, I'd like to really um, quickly also take up something that, that uh, Craig Kennedy said about the, mm -hmm. the banks and the compliance departments. So I've, I've got an unusual situation that I have. I have two hats. I've worked in government organizations and I've worked in banking. And um, one of the, first of all, in terms of how, how we look at Russia from a, from a government point of view, um, and as opposed to how we would look at Iran or somewhere else, there was a sense in the 90s and in the early 2000s that a lot of us really, and I was working in government then, a lot of us really believed or really wanted to believe that Russia was moving toward a rule-based rule -based system. And although we all knew that a lot of the money that was flowing into it through Western banks was, well, a little bit doubtful, there was this sense that, okay, our, our, our priorities for capitalism to take root in, in Russia, whether or not that was uh, the right thing to want is also um, up, to, up for debate. And so we were obsessed with, with the idea of capitalism taking root, obsessed with the idea it has to start somewhere, it's gonna start off dirty, it'll clean up over the time. And we've often talked about the, the, um, uh, the rubber barons in the United States. Well, this is what Russia is going through now. And by about 2003, I think it was pretty obvious to a lot of people that this is not what was happening, but it's, it has taken a long time for mindsets to change. And the threat isn't as obvious. You know, we, we don't have a revolutionary guards walking around Moscow. We don't have um, uh, conventional warfare being, being seen as a threat to the extent that it is seen as a threat from some other countries. We don't have the obvious terrorist threat coming from Russia. So I think that from government's point of view to have a very clear and cut guidelines is much more difficult. And from the banker's point of view, yes, to, to go uh, back to what Craig said, and compliance officers are also often in an impossible situation because the revenue generators in banks are the ones who are bringing in the money. That is how the banks make their money. And they are often seen as the sort of, you know, I would live in terror of some of the compliance officers, <laughs> even though I would try and do as much due diligence as I could before bringing clients to them because their interests and my interests were in direct conflict and we lived within the same organization. And ultimately my interests are those of the banks. And one of the banks I worked in actually decided at one point to completely stop working with Russian money because it was just too complicated to figure out where it came from. Mm. Quick message about, about France, are any other countries facing these questions and asking themselves these questions? My experience of France is that um, there is an acknowledgement that there was a problem with uh, Russia <clears throat> interfering with the elections, uh, both uh, in Macron's election and in the recent European parliamentary elections. There have been, there's been a spate of cyber attacks against French hospitals in the last few weeks, but the, the level of discourse about this is actually much lower than in the UK. And I, I, I'm in contact with quite a lot of people in, in Macron's party. When I tell them what I think about Russian money and the whole Russian influence and everything else, they just think I'm absolutely mad and, and, and a bit of a fruitcake who spent far too long um, in Russia and in the UK. And it's very difficult to be taken seriously. Um, I know that uh, Anais, is, uh, Anais Maha is listening uh, to us today. Maybe she has another uh, experience with the French. I find the message very difficult to get across. Yeah, that's my experience as well. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate that, Sam. And thank you again to Josh for pasting your research there. Um, Tim, over to you to comment on anything Craig was saying, but also I had a question which was probably more for you than for anyone else was, as to where Kazakhstan fits into this picture. You mentioned Ukraine in your initial remarks, but I don't know if you want to say a couple of words about Kazakhstan. Yeah. Well. No, I just uh, totally agree with Craig. I mean, you know, my involvement in that KYC kind of process in banks, um, you know, I think that there's a fundamental problem. I mean, essentially, it's the regulators should set, set the tone uh, 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 but but I think one of the problems we have is um, just the kind of process. Let's imagine an oligarch from a country in FSU space. I mean, the process we go for through. I mean, firstly, it's the question is, you know, have they got a have they got criminal convictions? I mean, it's the basic. You know, have, have they got sort of legal uh, sort of a criminal criminal form? Um, and, and usually the answer is absolutely not, right? Because they come from countries where there's no rule of law, right? Uh, um, so uh, I, I think the regulator should to change the risk weights associated with countries with, with dodgy jurisdictions where there isn't rule of law, make it much easier uh, for banks when they're going through this KYC kind of process. And I'll just give you a very interesting kind of story again. Uh, I do remember talking to a very, you know, a very high profile uh, DCM banker 
who has uh, been in and out of, of, of the US administration and, t- and telling me dur- during uh, the, the noughties when they were uh, working in DCM covering Russia, that uh, this a particular US bank, um, they did the sniff test was whether or not the oligarch had blood on their hands. You know, and essentially if they had no blood on their hands, it was fine, right? Fine, you know, they were fine to do business with them because the money was made in the 80s and 90s and, you know, it was a crazy time and, you know, we just have to accept that, you know, we wanted these guys to make money and we hoped once they'd make money, they'd become like us. Well, the reality is they haven't, they've become hybrids. You know, it's like Alien, it's like the movie Alien in terms of they've, they've, uh, they're within our system and now they're corrupting the system from within and it's, it's a huge challenge. But anyway, just, just agreeing with what Craig said. On Kazakhstan, you know, uh, you know I, I'd put the, F, the whole FS, FSU space into a, a similar kind of story. I mean, you know, oligarchs, you know, we, we need to tread very carefully and do lots of KYC about very rich people uh, from that whole region, but but globally, right? Uh, understood. Thanks very much indeed, Craig. Uh, must crack on. We've got about half an hour. Um, I'm going to come to. I'm going to take two questions again orally. First from Anna Gomez and then from Volodymyr um, uh, Omelian. But uh, Anna Gomez first, please, if I may. Well, um, what you're saying uh, meets my own experience as an MEP for 15 years, uh, and I would point out that uh, indeed Russia has already achieved what they wanted. Brexit is a result of their interference or their action to uh, bring about this distrust. And the same is happening in other European countries, including my own, with the way they are enabling the far right. It's about destroying democracy. Uh, uh, My particular question, you've mentioned, I I couldn't agree more with uh, Sam about the, the need to tackle the question of libel laws and the impunity for enablers. Yes, because I mean, all this army of lawyers and bankers and consultants, they have to indeed, uh, the only way to stop it is to make them as well punishable for, for the, the, their uh, neglect, so to say. Uh, my question is, uh, you've mentioned the city of London, of course, it's also the Crown Dependencies and uh, the, all the, the network of tax havens. The trusts, British trusts, British trusts were defended by Tory MEPs to prevent uh, more effective anti-money laundering directives in the EU. Um, Free ports, the next thing is free ports, of course, about Mm -hmm. the the Mm -hmm. stashing of uh, valuable goods. There's a reference to cyber attack, but I saw none to cryptocurrencies. And I'd like to ask you, because I I think this is something that is more uh, urgent than ever. It's obvious in several places that's including in the EU, like Malta and so on, that style themselves as cryptocurrencies hub. And that is also a tool for uh, interference and for all the nasty uh, nefarious action that has been described. Thank you. Okay, so I, I, I sort of mostly understood, yeah, I guess the, um... The question was really sort of a dog that didn't bark on trust and tax havens, free ports and cryptocurrencies um, to mention the things we didn't mention. Do you want to go first again, Tim? I don't mind, but Tim, perhaps? You know, cryptocurrency is not my area. I'm going to bow out of that one. It's too high tech for me. <laughs> Understood. Anything else? Uh, Sam, anything else? doesn't have to be on crypto, but it can be on the other, uh, the other elements that Anna mentioned. So, um, again, crypto isn't my area, but I, I have a son who is an IT whiz who's been telling me all about cryptocurrencies. A lot of them are, uh, there's a lot of crypto mining in Russia and Ukraine. Um, is that something you should be concerned about? I have absolutely no idea, but it's something that's interesting to note. Um, regarding what Anna Gomez said about British trust, yes, we also have to remember foundation, which can be incorporated, well, not incorporated, but can be settled in, in Luxembourg and in Liechtenstein. Foundations have even more anonymity than trusts, and uh, you even have a practice called um, putting straw men, they usually straw men, not straw women for some reason, at the head of, uh, of foundations to a completely <clears throat> obscure beneficial owner. That uh, does not happen in, in Liechtenstein and Luxembourg, but it does happen in some of our wonderful tropical islands. And these are, of course, okay, we're, ra- we're raising these flags here, but is there any will to do anything about it? Uh, one of the questions I see uh, is, the: do we think there's a political will to tackle this effectively? 
I, for one, certainly don't see it. I don't see it in the UK. I see a little bit more um, in, in the European Parliament, a little bit more uh, will to do this. I don't really see anything serious. And, and it's worrying. Josh, got any experience on these issues? Well, yeah, a, a, a little bit on a couple of them, but um, you know, I'm just heartened to to hear the the the, the question. I mean, the, just the, the fact that you know, off the top of your head, you've got like a, a lot of these good things that you know that, that we do need to be following up on trust, <clears throat> on dependencies, crypto. So for 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 crypto, um, that in that COVID, corporate foreign money uh, research, we included that. And there were actually only a couple and not the biggest dollar amount. It's like, if, if you were to rank the different loopholes or vectors that would be near the bottom in terms of the amount that it's actually used right. for nefarious plots, but it is an important one. It is, it's growing. And I mean, we saw the GRU use Bitcoin to, to buy their hack and leak infrastructure in 2016. And Mueller said that was because of the perceived anonymity, their sense that they would be able to um, be more covert in those financial channels. I mean, they got caught, but like the fact that that's the perception uh, at the GRU and there are the other stories about like the possibility of Russia funneling um, Bitcoin to the Daily Stormer. It's like a hate website mm. in the in the U.S. There are a couple of cases, um, but they're not they're not big amounts. But something to watch and, and certainly regulate. Um, trusts are a really big problem, and the next big problem for us here in the U.S. because we have you now beneficial ownership coming on companies, but that's not going to include trusts. So, I'm. No, that's another thing that I'm advocating for the U.S. to essentially tackle that the same way we did companies, which is make the banks do it, which we did with the CDB rule a couple of years ago. And then that motivates the banks to go to Congress and then get the government to do it. Um, but we need to start that by putting the bank, banks and partnerships and foundations into what's called our, 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 our customer due diligence rule um, now. And then hopefully later we can get them into our beneficial ownership. But that's, a, that's a good priority. And, and like you said, the crown dependencies, that is that crown dependencies and like to, to, to really go global in all of this is what I was referring to before about how if the Biden administration wants to really go big, uh, they could... It, counter the the proposals at the OECD of like a, a digital services tax with like saying okay well or maybe in addition to but what we really want to do is end offshore secrecy once and for all everywhere with concrete commitments around around registries around state <clears throat> asset or an asset register a lot of things to make that specific and concrete and most importantly um, sanctions to to motivate compliance with all of FATCA type sanctions harmonized around the world. That would be a big diplomatic project, but uh, really important to do. Very interesting. Thanks a lot, Josh. Um, I am going to uh, I'm going to try and group some written questions together. Um, several of them seem to come by, come come from at least three people are called James who are asking questions. But before I do that, um, I'll go to Volodymyr Melian, please, from Ukraine, former diplomat, I believe, or maybe current diplomat. I'm not sure, sir. <laughs> Not, not anymore. Uh, right. <laughs> good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let me start uh, with thanking to Timothy Ash for inviting me in. And I'm very privileged to be among such a distinguished auditory. Uh, I would like maybe to start with uh, reminding us a quote of one great American who once said that we shouldn't be threatened by Russian because all Russian elite are already in the West. They keep their money in Western banks, they educate their children in uh, Western universities, and they buy property over there. But unfortunately, he was wrong, because uh, the biggest mistake of the West, I believe, that you treat Russia as a democracy. And you come uh, to uh, evaluate Russian actions from the normal human point of view. And uh, it it has nothing to do with Russia, which is ruled by one man. And the second big mistake is that we believe that if we change or we replace Putin with somebody else, the situation will go differently. It will not. Ukraine is fighting back Russia for centuries. And regardless, they have Tsars, uh, secretary generals or presidents, they want to occupy Ukraine. And they would like to go west with any, any means. And uh, if you take into, into account the situation in Russia, only Putin or a company of few men is responsible for all actions and decisions, including 
who is uh, privileged to be oligarch or who is not. You can easily ask Mr. Khodorkovsky about his destiny. Unfortunately, you cannot ask Mr. Berezovsky because he is dead already. And uh, Russia get used well how to use Western or democratic instruments to uh, uh, impose their actions and their force over the West. And the only game of Russia is not to control the United Kingdom or, let's say, Ukraine, but to make chaos in Ukraine or United Kingdom. Volodymyr, and, can I just interrupt yes. for a second? So, I mean, I don't think many people on this call are uh, under many illusions or laboring under many illusions about, about what Russia is doing. So can I, can I, as we have short of time, can I beseech you to come to a question, please? Yeah, thank you a lot. Thank you, sir. And uh, in, in my opinion, you, sh you should track Russian money you should understand that you are already on war. And definitely uh, the sanctions you impose right now on Russia, it's maybe the best instrument right now West can present to nowadays threats. Thank you. Okay, I, I'll take that as, as a comment actually, rather than a question, because I think, I think yes. that's, 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 that's well taken. I appreciate that. Um, I am now going to come to James Sher, please. And then I'll come to James Rogers after that. In fact, I'll link James Rogers' question to Robert Brinkley's in fact. But James Sher first, please. Unmute, please. I have, yep. a comment, which I have a comment, which I hope will be short. Sounds good. I, I think it's important to remember that many of the people we are talking about in the financial and corporate sectors are the intellectual products of the 1990s. They believed that Western liberal capitalism was instrumental in destroying the Soviet Union. And many of them continue to believe that Western liberal capitalism is going to integrate Russia into Europe. And it's not only in the UK where people believe that. In Germany, you could find mass of people who believe it. What we have never had since um, the 90s has been what we had after the Second World War. We've never had a 1947 moment when our political leaders said, whatever was the case before, the rules have changed and we are not dealing with that now, we are dealing with something else. I want to, uh, so I want to reaffirm Josh's point that what has been missing and what we need to spend, pay more attention to is what is being done at the political level. You can't substitute the political leadership by simply tightening up laws and by incremental changes. It has to come from the very top and has to be pulled together so that there is traction amongst all the entities we need to have pulling together. So it's an invitation to Josh to add more recommendations if he wants to, but that's my comment. Thank you. James, that's very interesting because I remember you saying a few years ago in all the discussions we've had that any, some, one of the things we need to do was simply to enforce and tighten our own laws. But what I'm hearing from you is that we've gone beyond that now. And in fact, it's, 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 it's gotten worse to the extent that it's, we need to do a lot more than just tighten and enforce our own laws. We need to frankly create new ones, I suppose. Is that, is that fair, James? We need to have we need to have the equivalent of a Harry Truman and a Winston Churchill saying, this is the problem we face. Okay. We have a, our, our relationship with Russia is one of antagonism. It's an antagonistic relationship and we have to, we have to respond accordingly. Not just that, you know, there have been horrible episodes where Russia's done X, Y, and Z and we get very excited and then we forget about it. The political leaders need to okay. make sure that, mm -hmm. we are, that we are operating yep. in the right framework. Got it, thank you. Um, I'm gonna move on to a couple of questions now. One is from Robert Brinkley, uh, chairman of our Ukraine forum. Bro Robert says, um, the problems of dirty money being launched through London are not new. Okay, the speakers referred to initial steps to tackle it by previous UK governments. And he says, why has it proved so difficult to take effective action? I know you've partially answered that, Tim, Sam, and, and others, but I would like to try to elaborate on why the hell, <laughs> where are the obstacles? You know, who, who is it? Is, is, it a, is it a person or is it an institution? But, but I, you know, you, you sort of tackled it conceptually, Tim, and I wondered if, if, if you could elaborate a little bit on the obstacles. And then, and then sort of similarly, on a similar vein, James Rogers, um, an academic at a City University, um, says, given the sums of money that Tim mentioned in his opening remarks and given the likely state of the post-pandemic British economy, do a panelist think that the, that the political will, because this is part of the answer to the question, I suppose, um, will be forthcoming? Um, so, okay, Tim first, please. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I was just writing down some notes, you know, 
it, I guess the key to this is understanding the threat, but accepting there's going to be a cost. You know, if yep. we think that the defending Western liberal democracies is worthwhile, we have to accept that it's the prices, you know, reining in some of that $350 million a year of income in the city, right? Because this is a systemic threat to, to what we do. Um, and, you know, uh, in terms of Robert's question, you know, uh, you know, and that's very difficult in a Brexit environment where the economy is very challenged. You've got COVID going on, you know, to, to add, you know, to, to put up a message, you know, we're closed to international capital of, uh, you know, of somewhat suspect origin. You know, I guess that's quite challenging for, for, for politicians to do. But in the end, look, I think our system works better than many other systems around the world. I think what we have is worth, worth defending. I think rule of law is bloody hard to build. It's taken us 300 years, however you want, want to say it. I mean, if you look at emerging Europe, countries like Romania, Poland, Bulgaria, you know, 30 years on, and they still haven't done it. They haven't still achieved it. But I think, you know, the, the, the power, the corrupting power of this money, you know, could, could, could undermine rule of law in the UK within a decade. And, and it kind of, once it's gone, you know, one of the big selling points in the city of London is our, our legal system kind of works. Even the oligarchs rather like using it, right? They Because they don't trust their own systems. Sam, sorry, do you want to weigh on this, please? Yes, okay, yes. Um, well, actually, I, I'm seeing rather bleak, if you want, to be <laughs> honest. Um, why is it so difficult to take effective action? I think it's because there's just no political will to take the effective action. And why is there no political will to take effective action? Well, one can only speculate, I'm not a member of government, I haven't even lived in the UK for the past 20 years, so this is an outsider's point of view. I think there's no political will for a number of potential reasons. One could be a naivety as to the scale Dudley, of the sorry. problem. Uh, is, is, our, is the leadership just naive? Um, are they overwhelmed? Are we, we're, we're facing the sort of what, what I call brovid, you know, Brexit and COVID at the same time. Um, are you really going to have any bandwidth to, to think about what Russia may or may not be doing? It'll be very interesting to see if the UK responds um, with sanctions against um, the individuals at the UK, that um, the EU has uh, announced sanctions on, to see you know, what, what the mindset is. I don't see uh, much, um, much sort of, grounds for, for, for thinking that things are going to change in the near future, unless there's a lot of political question, uh, a lot of political pressure from the, from the opposition or from parliament onto the current government to, to start cleaning up this act. Because uh, quite frankly, um, the, the, we're talking about having trade relations with the rest of the world, while Russia's part of the rest of the world. How much pressure are we going to have there? How much pressure will there be at some point to start um, buying Russian vaccines? I mean, whatever one may, I'm not a vaccine specialist. I'm not even going to comment on how good it is. But this, these are the kind of pressures we're going to be facing, which are going to be much mm -hmm. more pressing than, you know, satisfying a bunch of Russia hawks who think that we're going into a war. So I'm actually rather bleak. I have no idea why nothing's been done, but I have a lot of... Um, uh, mm -hmm. Let's say that, as I said, the, 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 it does not look good when you look at what the government does and doesn't do. Thanks. Uh, that makes sense and resonates as well, Sam. Josh, do you have an across upon perspective on why we've been as bad as we've been and about sort of political will and more broadly? Well, why don't I share some ac across the pond optimism? I feel like we need to look at <laughs> okay. that. I, Thank you. I mean, there is a fair, despite everything that we're going through in our democracy and all the challenges we have, technical, political, we had insurrection, we have all this stuff, but like, there is a fair amount of optimism here in in DC. Um, this this sense that um, also for, for for those of us who work in, in foreign policy, um, that we've now gotten through the hardest part of saving our democracy when it was really and truly on the brink. And there, despite all of the challenges that we continue to have, um, we have an new administration who, who gets that and cares about, about foreign policy and the traditions of the alliance system and the special relationship. And um, we now have an opportunity to essentially, to some degree, especially after COVID is under control, go global in terms of saving, helping democracies save themselves. Um, and 
um, there, there, there's a lot that that can entail, and it's going to require local, local leadership and political will at the local level. But like Sam was just mentioning, the need for political pressure from the opposition and from parliament. I would say political pressure from across the pond can be helpful uh, on this is as well. A little bit of the opposite of uh, the, the, you know, J James mm -hmm. mentioned the, 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 the Roosevelt Churchill. I mean, it was Churchill who was bringing Roosevelt into the war, you know, so flip that dichotomy a little bit. And, um, you know, maybe there's an opportunity to, to follow Biden's lead uh, in really getting serious about all these challenges we're talking about. Right. Thanks very much, Josh. We are pretty short of time now, so I'm going to do one last question and maybe ask one of my own at the very end. So um, Irina Diemchenko asks an interesting question. Um, Irina is formerly of Rhea Novosti and I think probably an independent analyst now, but you can correct me if I'm wrong, Irina, on the chat. Um, Irina says this, uh, people like Yelena Baturina, um, or name any other, she says, who earned their money by corruption uh, and stealing in Russia have already laundered their money several times. So she asks, is it too late to come after, after them now? The main problem is the operative on-duty wallets uh, of a Russian authority, she says, um, and the people who are authorized to finance for special operations to influence the West. Uh, obvious one is RT, but there are others. Um, watch those Russians who pay for the charities and pay tens of OPM, she says, including main political parties. I won't go on there, but I mean, that's, a, that's because of Irina asks, asks a longer, longer question. It also includes the, the House of Lords, which Sam referred to. But um, I, I, guess, I guess the question to summarize, Irina, to summarize Irina's point is, is, you know, at what point does laundered money become clean in a way? Because it's some, some, you know, a lot of these people, I mean, you know, we, a lot of people we, we think about as being sort of altruistic, philanthropic today, um, seem to have cleaned up their reputations, laundered their reputations, uh, maybe be doing very good work in many other cases. So a question is, is how far back um, does one go? I don't know if that's a, it's a, it's quite a, I haven't really pinpointed the question very well there, but um, do you want to have a go at uh, how far back we can go? Sam, if I pick on you first for a change. <laughs> okay. Um, yes. Well, that's, that's a, an excellent question because it's one that I ask myself a lot. Uh, I think there are genuine people, I mean, genuine um, conversions. I'm thinking about not, not in the religious conversion uh, sense, but people who maybe made mm -hmm. their money illicitly in the beginning, who suddenly uh, decided to start trying to play by the rules or to uh, put their money to good use. Um, Khodorkovsky looks as though he could be one of those people. I, I don't know enough about him to really go into, in, in, into detail, but he looked like one of those examples. <laughs> I think that um, if we are going to do anything effective about the situation, we just have to draw a line and the line can be drawn today because if we start looking back, then um, we're just going to spend so much time trying to figure out what's clean and what's not clean. We're not going to be able to tackle anything at all. When I draw a line, mm -hmm. I don't mean uh, drawing a line on absolutely everything. I think there are certain very obvious uh, sources of money that have, have very clear direct links to the current regime, which, which, is, which, which we should just stop doing any more work with. And that means any more mm -hmm. work in terms of accepting their companies to float on the stock exchange or anything else. But I think we have to draw a line somewhere because otherwise we're never going to move forward. And that we seems have to so not so. look back. Yeah, I've always thought that if there's a little arbitrariness to an our part and you know, we don't get it entirely right and we're entirely consistent, it's better than doing nothing at all. Um, that may sound harsh, but uh, Josh, any thoughts on <laughs> how far back, who to pick, et cetera? Yeah, when does dirty money become clean? Yeah, that when one when their ultimate beneficial owner or handler intermediary becomes clean like it it i mm -hmm. it, it's a it's a good question it's a good legal question i mean it makes me think of the challenge the legal questions of uh unexplained wealth orders but like the you it i think a, a better way of of designing our protections are going to be not around a specific transaction or flow but who what who's the individual the nature of the individual around which uh, it's it's ultimately tied. I mean, that's a little bit more how how sanctions work. That's what I'm trying to get in the United States are CFIUS uh, folks to 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 adopt that posture, especially with really relates to corruption. It's not whether or not you know Oleg Deripaska's purchase of like mining assets in Kentucky itself had corruption on the face of that transaction. It's who's the player uh, I I involved, and that's. Maybe I don't know mm -hmm. about legally, but at least from like a policy perspective, that's interesting. interesting. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Anything to weigh in on this one? Uh, I mean, I'm only thinking a little bit about Ukraine, and uh, I mean, essentially, you want oligarchs to change behavior in their 
their home countries, right? To, to begin to support rule of law in their own countries and, you know, what you need to do, uh, you know, to, 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 push, to, to push that forward. Um, I mean, Ukraine's gone down this anti-corruption kind of institutional kind of approach mm-hmm. and really it's not really working, I, I think, because the oligarchs outgun the... Uh, the the the, poach, the gamekeepers in a way. I mean, they've got so much legal firepower behind them that they, they can run rings around this this new structure that's been created. And and you know whatever it is, uh, seven years on from Euromaid, and no one's gone to jail basically. So mm-hmm. so I mean, at the time, interestingly, I, I recommended a welfare tax and a truth and reconciliation process. The oligarchs declare, you know, they made all this money illegally, or however they made it, they pay whatever it is, ten percent, twenty five percent tax, and and then they 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 move on. You know, and if they break the new rules of the game after, you know, after, you know, day one or whatever it is, they, 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 they met with maximum sanction, 100 percent kind of confiscation, you know, 20 years in jail, all that kind of thing. But, the, you know, the, the Ukrainians went down, you know, the, the, the kind of penal kind of approach and it, and it has failed. Mm. I mean, let's be honest about it. I Absolutely, mean, yeah. you know, behavior hasn't changed and no one's gone to jail. Yeah, although I think Josh was mentioning that Zelensky may have found a little bit of the backbone in the last week or so, or a couple of weeks or so, but I take your point there, um, Tim. Uh, ladies and gents, it is 32 minutes past the hour, but I said well, I might go until five past the five past the half past, and I'll do that by ans- asking um, selfishly my own question, if I may, just, just to finish off with, if you'll bear with me. Um, I, can I just ask, so again, a sort of a slightly more optimistic question, perhaps in a way, and I'd like to ask our panelists to dream a little bit. It's a slightly utopian question, but can you imagine a world where <laughs> if your recommendations are adopted, what would that look like? What effect would that have? Um, you know, how, what would we see? What would improve? What would get better? I mean, how much better would it be? A bit better, a lot better? Uh, can you, it's a slightly, you, I, I'm asking you to sort of, you know, theorize, extemporize a little bit here um, and, and dream a little. It seems like it might be a good note to end upon. Um, let's go with uh, original order, perhaps. Um, so Tim again, if, if that's okay. I hope the question was I'm clear. Gonna, <laughs> I'm going to answer your, answer your question, actually go back to the original question you asked, right in the original um, the original session we had with Chatham House on the on the on the, the House of Commons paper, right? So, so in terms of how, what the world would look like, I yeah. mean, if 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 oligarchs were kind of brought to account, we clean yeah. uh, their act. So, you know, maybe a lot of these countries would look different, right? You know, imagine Ukraine with the rule of law, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, you know, per capita GDP there is three thousand, Poland's ten thousand, whatever it is. You know, maybe these countries would 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 experience higher and more inclusive growth, right? The world would be better, wealthier, more, more equal. Mm-hmm. Results of it. And, and actually, can I just answer before we close? Again, mm-hmm. this question, you asked uh, at the outset of, of getting together for this session, you know, whether we should, we should basically adopt a very aggressive approach to, to Russian oligarchic capital, right? That basically we should shut mm-hmm. the door completely, right? We, you know, uber, uber aggressive. Um, and I would say the default setting should be very close to that, right? And, and the reason that is the case, in my mind, is that, you know, essentially, again, going back to the basics, right? Do we, ex- do we think Russia is a threat to our system? Absolutely, right? Is the system, is, is, the, is the city a, uh, a conduit for that? Absolutely. And, and let's, let's be kind of honest about this. If you think of the kind of oligarchs we're talking about in Russia, the big billionaire oligarchs i mean how did really did they they made their money with the support of the russian state well the most of them i would i would argue a great deal of them only made their money because of the acquiescence of the russian state and or the russian criminal underworld as as catherine belton said so so the, the default assumption should be that these large oligarchs are agents of of the russian state right and i i'd say Given the threat to our system, they have to prove otherwise, because they are clearly a national security threat to, to our, our, our way of, of governance, right? So, so I would be, I, I would, mm-hmm. you know, totally reset and take a very aggressive approach. So, apologies, I, I no, still, I, I hijacked your uh, your question and threw 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 a second answer back. Super, Tim. Thanks a lot, uh, Sam. Beat that. Um, you're asking me to dream. Well, I would say we mm-hmm. would rejoin the EU and the current government <laughs> would collapse and, um, and Russia would become a law-based democracy. Um, but uh, joking aside, 
Oh, so all our recommendations were implemented. Well, I think in the in, in the beginning we would see a um, a, a vast uh, change in our relationship with Russia, and and Russia would become more of an adversary, and maybe even more openly so. And it might might be easier to implement even more changes. And I think it, it could have a snowball effect. As once we start really tightening our rules. There will be a response. And if there's a response, there could be a snowball effect, which would make tightening further rules perhaps a lot easier. I think that um, to do that, we would need help from our friends across the pond, because mm -hmm. if we have uh, clear support from our friends across the pond, then uh, then that would be very positive. And we could even see a, a strengthening of transatlantic relations, which have uh, been sorely damaged. So yes, we would go back to the world as it was when I started working about nearly two years ago and uh, everything would be wonderful. Uh, yeah. I, uh, okay. I don't actually see that happening. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, I'm, I'm not sure we'll, 30 years ago, I'm not sure where was a golden age, but I take, I take you, I take you, I take a broader point. Thanks a lot, Sam. Uh, Josh, any final thoughts? Yeah, uh, this, everything we're talking about today has really historic potential to offer the grand strategy that we've been grasping for since since the Cold War, and it's kind of the inverse mm -hmm. of the Cold War. Like at that time, deregulatory neoliberalism, it suited both our, our domestic political economy by providing freedom and growth, but also naturally suited our, our geopolitical interests in, in you know, presenting a more attractive model on the world stage to communism. Now that our authoritarian rivals are organized not as communists, but as kleptocrats, not trying to convince the masses of anything, but just trying to, to, to rob them and fill the pockets of their cronies. It, it, that, that change makes it so that it, it, our natural alternative is quite, is quite different. It's, it's, it's to offer a model of clean capitalism under the rule of law, leaning into those elements of our system, which by the way, so happen to once again, suit our domestic political economy when we've got on both the far left and extreme, everyone talking, you know, the, the voters are, are resonate significantly with, with messaging about a, a, a rigged system and the swamp and all of this stuff, right? So to actually produce results for them can be helpful domestically and, and internationally in a way that our strategy was and was very effective in, in the Cold War. And so to like to end on note of optimism, it could end in that, in that way again. And we may even be in a later stage of not just Putinism, but kleptocracy than, uh, than, we, that, that, than we know. I mean, in, in, in the 1980s, nobody thought that we, that we were about to, to, to uh, strike a decisive win, strategic win. And it's possible that, that we're there now, but we have a lot of work to do together right now to get I'm not sure that's an optimistic note or a pessimistic note, but I, I take the point. Thank you very much indeed, Josh, and obviously to everybody else. But first of all, let me say I'm very sorry for extending this by, by 10 minutes, but it's, uh, everyone stayed. So it was, it was that's testament to its um, the depth and insight and some fascinating stuff. And I can't imagine that anybody hasn't learned uh, quite a lot here today. Um, I'm very sorry also not to get to everybody's questions. Um, Keith, Wittas, Domitilla, Bianca, many others. I, I apologize for that. That's all. You can put all the blame on that on me. Um, and perhaps, but you know, by way of extending that, and anybody who has any ideas as to how we can uh, do a continuation, extend this, where we can send this, as I said earlier, um, what we can do as we seem to be on the, I, I do also sense that we're on the verge of um, you know, just a little, a small breakthrough here with the, as I say, with the EU sanctions on those four individuals earlier today, there may be a, um, a small window of opportunity here. And if, if Chatham House can help in any way and you have any ideas for that, then please do write to Anna or Adam or myself. Um, but finally, of course, to thank uh, Sam, Tim and Josh for three outstanding um, uh, presentations initially, but really for handling those excellent questions uh, so well. It really has been a, a super session. So my thanks to everybody, all the organizers, um, as well naturally and hopefully we'll do something along these lines very very soon or, or maybe have a try to have a more practical effect as practical effect as we possibly can that do tank not think tank kind of thing in the meantime i wish everybody goodbye thanks a lot all the best